Hello conservationists and welcome to chapter 13, Managing Populations with Mrs. Foes. So a population, as you remember, is a group of the same species that are interacting, interbreeding, um, same time, same place. For example, that would be each of the different species would be a population in the same river. So this chapter, we're going to cover a few topics. First, why it would be necessary to manage populations, uh, some management aspects, and monitoring techniques. So managing at the population level would be considered a fine filter approach. So if you remember ecosystem level, if you said, I'm going to save this part of the rainforest, that would be a coarse filter approach. Because as long as you save that whole forest, you're probably going to save most of the biodiversity there. A fine filter approach would be working on a specific species there to make sure that they were uh, surviving and conserved. So when would this be necessary? So think about that for a second. Um, okay, you ready for the answer? I'm sure you thought about it really hard. Okay, so this would be necessary if there were specific issues facing that population, like they were overexploited whether it be for pet trade or hunting or they have some sort of economic value. Now let's look at some management aspects and one of the big things is looking at what the limiting factor is for that species. So what is it that they need more of? What is keeping their carrying capacity too low? So then think about what some possible limiting resources are. You got it? Some big ones water, nesting habitat, food, burrows. Well, let's look. Look at that. We were indeed correct. Food is a factor that we might need to manage for. So what you're doing there is you're giving more of the food resource for that species. And if that truly is the limiting factor, their population should go up. Uh, so you can do this in a couple different ways. You can remove competing plant species. That's a big one, especially invasives, to allow those natives that they eat to grow. Um, and oftentimes you'll see this done at sites for reintroductions where you'll be putting in these stressed creatures and giving them extra food gives them a better likelihood of surviving. Uh, we do this all the time with bird seed. We supplement bird feeding, although sometimes that works against them because then hawks can use that as a spot to look for birds to eat. Um, here's an example of where this was successful. Uh, it was in cranes in Japan. So there's two species here, the hooded crane and the white-naped crane. And you can see their populations in the 50s were incredibly low. And then once they started supplemental feeding, those populations rose dramatically, especially the hooded crane. Uh, I was an intern for a zoo for a while in Fargo and uh, they had a white nape crane his name was Stanley he was the worst he was four feet tall and so I'd have to go in he shared the big enclosure with these little kudu and little tiny antelope they're real cute look them up but anyways he would follow me around the whole time as I was using my shovel and had the garbage can to like put the poop into and I had to like shove the garbage can between us because he would go to attack me so, yay, they were saved, but glad I don't have to deal with them. Could there be any downsides to adding food? There are. First, you have an increased population density. So if you have, you know, 8,000, 9,000 cranes in an area that's small, you'll have this huge density where they're all closely packed. Uh, big issues here can be that they can devastate the area around them. Also, if you have a ton of people around and you get the flu, you can spread it really easily. So same idea there. If you have an increased population density, you're more likely to get sick and spread it to other individuals. The other downside would be human dependence, where they might not be able to forage properly on their own anymore. So one of the things that zoos will do oftentimes is if they're going to release a species back into the wild, they'll have it in as close to wild conditions as they can to make sure they can hunt on their own. Another limiting factor is water. And in dry areas, this can be seasonal. So in the rainy season, you're fine. In the dry season, 
whoever gets water is going to survive. And I've discussed this before in other lecture videos, but this is going to be a very important management tool if one of your goals is to have tourists get wildlife sightings. If you have a water hole, you know you're going to see species there. It's an open space, and you can predict where you're going to see that wildlife. And it's not blocked by anything. In the park that I worked at, that was where everyone went to. You went to water holes. Maybe you saw something between, but you knew you were going to see something there. From elephants to buffalo, zebra, as they say, uh, warthogs, lots of different wildlife. One question you do have to figure out is where does the water come from? Is it going to be sustainable to do this? Are you going to need to put piping in? Is there like a natural well there that you can tap into? How is that going to work? Let's see, can you think of any downsides? The big one is that some species can dominate. So where I was, especially when it was hot out, you knew you were going to see elephants there and they would dominate that water hole. And what was pretty cool is you could tell where the pipes were because the dominant individual would get that fresh water, whereas the subordinates would be further away from that fresh water coming in. Um, we actually saw an elephant kill a buffalo because it was at the water and the buffalo wanted water and the elephant said no and he was an aggressive, uh, kind of the right age for that, sub-adult. It's crazy. And then again, if you have a larger population, it can affect the plant species around there. So they might take more of their other resources. In our park, Addo, it was like a bomb went off around the big water holes. You know, there was no plants for a while. Other factors, just the physical environment, um, including a benign microclimate. So benign is nice. So it would be like a shelter. So these little cacti are growing in the shelter that's provided. They wouldn't grow out in the open. Or concealment from predator's prey. We've talked about how open fields uh, will get rodents killed because hawks can find them really easy and substrate. So this example goes really well with that first case study we did on tortoises and how they needed a very specific substrate to lay their eggs. Um, more examples, you need those dead trees, hollow logs, they can be nesting spots. Uh, brush piles are another big one. Sometimes you can do artificial reefs. Cool. In invasive species chapter, we looked at the different types of interspecific interactions, the types of interactions that can occur between species. And so sometimes to have one species present, you need another. So those symbiotic, or remember that means they interact. It doesn't necessarily mean positive. So fungal symbionts for plants that mycorrhizae, where the fungus is on the outside of the plants and they help each other out. Parasites need hosts, so that is not a mutualism, that's a parasitism. Butterflies and ants in England, this is a really fun one. So there's a species of butterfly that lays its egg next to an ant nest, and then those ants, once the egg hatches and the larva, they help feed the caterpillar, and then they protect it too. Pretty cool. And then last, so sometimes you'll need some of that species there for others to come in and say it's safe. So like if you put a fake duck on a pond, you're more likely to have other ducks land because they see it's a safe space. So you might want to have decoys or vocalizations of those other individuals there. That is tapeworm. Parasitic. So when you're managing, you also have to control threats. So if that species needs management because it's overexploited, you need to manage the poachers. Uh, so that they can't come in and kill things. You need to uh, fix that supply and demand. Look at, you know, for example, with rhinos, their horn is wanted medicinally, so you'd have to try to help with the demand and teach people that they don't actually need, like, fingernail protein uh, to get better and have appropriate harvest levels. So if you listen to Mr. Foz's lecture from, from Chapter 12, Part 2, he discusses optimal sustainable yield in fisheries, where you take as many fish out as you can to help people, but you don't take too many so that the next year the population hasn't been affected. They're right where they were. You also have to look at those interactions with species there, like predators. Is there invasive species predators there? 
Um, if the species are grazers, do they have what they need to graze? Can they use their regular patterns? And then parasites and pathogens, you have to treat them. So this is a black-footed ferret. Uh, ferrets are really cool. They actually are very similar immune system wise to us. They can get the same cold that you get, whereas your cat or dog can't. Um, another thing they can get though from dogs is distemper. And so one of the reasons their levels were incredibly low, they went extinct in the wild, uh, was that they were getting distemper. So now the ferrets are given the distemper vaccine before they're released again. And here we're using fire to help produce new grazing land. You'll also have to look at competition. Is there competition for resources for some reason with like an invasive species, for example? And then look at indirect threats by humans. So those structural issues that we discussed before. So for example, this is a pathway that amphibians can take. To get through spaces so they can go underneath roads for example like that. Here is crabs. Remember Christmas Island from Australia? Those are crabs crawling up and over this road. How amazing is that? That's a natural bridge like we looked at. They have those in Canada and Norway. Here they put fencing to protect chicks. And then this is a really interesting one. So this is time starting in the 50s to the 90s. And that's the population of bats. And what happened is they built a wall um, outside of a bat's nesting area. And so their population went way down. And then they replaced that wall with a grate where there were spaces in it. And they could echolocate. And the population went right back up again. So oftentimes we'll do direct manipulations. We've discussed translocations before. So that's taking some healthy individuals from one area and relocating them, like reintroducing them to where they were before. We saw that with the Kentucky elk. They translocated from Utah. And what we found is if species get there in under 18 hours, they usually survive any more, and they don't. Uh, the reason that that first group of elk didn't survive was that a truck driver stopped, met up with a girlfriend, went over that 18 hour mark. Heard that from a fish and wildlife guy. We'll also do other things to help get them ahead will breed based on their genetics. So artificial breeding, we determine it. We'll bring in more genetically diverse individuals. We'll do head starting, like these turtles, or tortoises, excuse me, where we'll raise them to a certain point and then release them. And we do hatcheries. So like if you go to Wolf Creek Dam in Kentucky, there's a fish hatchery there where they grow fish up to like fingerling size, your fingers, and then they'll release them back into their native waters. Here's a population of snakes where they saw that genetic diversity was going down, and so their number was going down. They introduced some more genetic diversity, and their population went up higher than it had been in a while. 20 years. Now let's look at monitoring populations. So when we monitor populations, anytime we're concerned about their numbers, if we're doing conservation efforts, we need to know where we're at. Remember that adaptive management? You need to be constantly assessing where you are and if what you're doing is working. And if it is, keep going. And if it's not, you need to change something. And then do we monitor each species in the same way? No. It's very species dependent. So your management project, look at how other people have monitored your species. I'm going to go through some common examples though. One thing that's very common is doing catch and recapture to estimate population size and learn about demographic info. And so that means male, female, age, etc. So there's a shark with a tag. Bird banding is very common. I've helped with that before. There's a radio collar on a loggerhead turtle. Okay. So then with that, you estimate your population size by looking at the number of tagged and the number then you go back again and resample that are tagged. So if you tag 10 guys and you get 10 back that are all tagged, you tag the whole population. If you tag 100 birds and you catch another 100 and none of them are tagged, there's probably a lot of birds, right? Pretty fun. 
Uh, to catch those birds, oftentimes you'll use uh, mist nets. That's also how you catch bats to tag them. Um, and we also do large-scale bird watches. So the Audubon Society does this. Um, they'll do your winter bird watch, your backyard bird watch, uh, where specific dates people can go out and collect information about the birds that they're seeing. So this is my bird checklist from a day. Oftentimes you'll do the number of individuals that you've seen uh, when you're out. That was in Kentucky, around Bowling Green, towards Franklin, and then up towards Mammoth Cave. Another fun one, especially for mammals, is camera traps. So I know that some of you in the class have camera traps where you'll look at what you found in your backyard, especially for elusive species as well as species that are nocturnal. Camera traps are the best way to see them and identify them. When I helped with a black rhino study in South Africa, we used camera traps to identify the individuals. Usually they came to the area around like 3, 5 a.m., not times that you'd want to be out at night there. Uh, and what we were doing was collecting their feces. So we'd collect the feces to look at their hormone levels, parasite levels, and we could tell which individual it was because we caught them on the camera trap that day. So this is pretty neat. And rhinos are really interesting in how they defecate. Haven't heard that before, probably. Uh, they all, they have different spots where they all go. And when they go, they like rub their foot through their poop to show you which direction they're going. And so you can tell like how big the individual was that was there uh, really easily. These are really cool new things that we're doing. Um, helicopters, drones, planes. I have a friend who is a biostatistician in Fairbanks, Alaska. He's always sending videos of him in planes looking at caribou and thousands of caribou at once. It's so cool. Um, and another new one is drones. I've had some students use drones in their management projects as a new way to monitor their population. Amphibians. There's some pretty interesting ones. This is a pitfall trap. What a lot of salamanders do is they'll follow along a line and then they just fall right in. And this is catching tadpoles. And then acoustics is another way. So I had a friend at Western who did his research and he created software to identify different species that were present. So the software could pick up when it was a spring peeper. I'm sure you've heard those this year. Um, versus a bullfrog, for example. Now it can't tell you numbers, but it can tell you species present in different locations. Insects, uh, pitfall traps, that's similar to what we looked at before. You have a cup, you got something sitting in there with a funnel, they go in, they fall through. Uh, pheromones and hanging traps, so we have one of these in our backyard and it's got Japanese beetle pheromone in it. Japanese beetles are incredibly invasive. They eat our cherry and apple tree leaves. They almost kill them, so we catch them in there uh, to get them out. This is a carpenter bee trap as well. So carpenter bees will burrow into your uh, wood. They don't serve a great ecological function. People oftentimes do that. And then we've talked a little bit about biological control before. This is an ignumen wasp. They're parasitic. So this is a tobacco hornworm. And what they did was they released the wasps so that they got infected. Great. Have a great day.